Good morning and happy Sabbath. Special welcome to everyone who joined us to worship this morning. Uh, special welcome to visitors. Special welcome to those who joined us over the internet. I'm just very, very happy to be here in my church family. Um, my wife Natasha and uh, Alina, they went to Portland for a um, baby shower. Uh, her brother's um, wife, Beatrice, is having another girl, which is a good uh, reason to celebrate, and we are very happy for them. So me and my boys, we have the weekend to ourselves, and uh, it's very special. I love them, and I, I appreciate them. Very grateful for the rain that the Lord has showered. He showered his blessings truly on us, and we, we are so grateful. We are so grateful. I want to begin with a story that took place in the old country um, some time ago um, in the army. Um, there was a lieutenant that was giving hard time to one particular soldier. And that soldier was looking for a time to kind of make things uh, even with the lieutenant, but he didn't have much chance. And um, there was a day when this particular soldier was assigned to be on duty at the checkpoint. And uh, the lieutenant that was over him on duty, that was in the same shift, was this particular lieutenant. And so they served faithfully for 24 hours, and as was required, at the end of the 24-hour period, the soldier was supposed to write a short report in the journal. So he wrote that everything went well, there was nothing unusual, everything was peaceful, um, everything was fine, everything was good. He just added one sentence, Lieutenant was sober. It was true information. I mean, he didn't say anything wrong. What did he do? By making a true statement of the fact. Well, you might be guessing what the sermon will be about. Um, we'll be continuing our journey through the Gospel of Matthew. And if we can get our uh, projector to, to show the slides. Is it on? Let's see. All right, it should be, should be coming. So as we come to, to the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, the whole book, has uh, three main sections dealing with the intro, intro, introduction of the king. Okay, let me check my, my signal here. Just a second. Should be getting it now. So the introduction of the king. A second section is on... Now let me check one more thing. I'm sorry. Oh, this cable got disconnected. All right, now we should be on... All right, let's see. It's all good. All right, we are back to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew has three main sections. First section is introduction of the king. Second section, the teachings and the activities of the king, which is Jesus. And the third section deals with um, suffering, sufferings, death, and resurrection of the king. In, in the whole Gospel of Matthew, we have five sermons of Jesus. So now we are coming to the fourth sermon of Jesus. There are two sermons that he gives to his disciples. Sermon number two and sermon number four. Sermon number two is given to disciples about his ethics and, his, and, their, and, their, ex, and their mission work. He's talking about their... Um, Dedication to the mission work. Fourth sermon is concentrated in their in internal ethics. 
has to do with their internal values, the character development, the attitudes of the disciples. And this is why I entitled the sermon, The Standard of Grace. Jesus is challenging his disciples, uh, and he will challenge us today. Disciples started the conversation. They're asking the question, Jesus, we are just wondering who is the greatest in your kingdom? What is the greatest thing we can do when we want to be on the top level of your kingdom? You see, they're still kind of um, confused about the nature of God's kingdom. And this is the background when Jesus is starting to, to talk to them. I invite you to open the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, and this is, will be our study today. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. Let's see. Huh, I have more difficulties than one. Let's see. All right. Let's see. Just, let's see. I'm surprised. Let's see. Well, I'll ask Chris to forward the slides for me. Would you please? Thank you. Uh, just space bar. Thank you. All right. Where are we? Matthew chapter 18, verses 2 and 3. Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and he said, Assuredly, I say to you, Unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus begins to talk about who would be the greatest in his kingdom by presenting a little child. How do we understand the words of Jesus? What does it mean to be like a little child? What does he want to teach us in his fourth sermon in the Gospel of Matthew? Well, some suggested that uh, being a little child uh, uh, is a symbol of innocence. But if you think about children, very often they're not quite innocent. In fact, they're very selfish. It takes years, it takes training to teach them to be thankful, to consider others. They're not very innocent in that regard. Some Christians in the second century, they went as far as to say that to be a true Christian, you have to forbid all sexuality because you need to be like a child to be a Christian. But I'm certainly glad that that view did not become very popular. Because Jesus did not mean that. If we look through the Bible, it's not consistent with the rest of the Bible. So what did Jesus mean when he said, that we need to be like children. I would like to suggest two things that Jesus would mean by that. Number one, being teachable as children. The word disciple means learner in original language. In fact, to become a Christian, we have to relearn everything we knew. We have to relearn everything to surrender to Christ and to accept his teachings, his will for our lives. Isn't that true? Jesus said, if you don't become like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Being teachable, being willing to, to learn from Jesus. Are we open to learn from God's word? Are we willing to change our lives if we come across the teaching of, of the Bible that is different from what we used to know or from what we used to do, are we willing to change? Are we willing to be taught by Jesus? 
It is interesting that Jesus did not call his disciples presidents or directors or CEOs. He taught them learners, disciples, always willing to learn. Another possibility why he presented the child, he wanted to show that the child is totally dependent on parents or guardians for food, shelter, care. The child trusts in the care of the parents, trusts in their love and their care. And when Jesus is talking about the children, then he moves on and he says, whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. What is he trying to teach his disciples? What is the lesson here? What does it mean to receive a child? I think Jesus is talking about something more than just, you know, treating a little child with care and concern. He talks about something much bigger. He talks about the whole culture of the church. He talks about the atmosphere of the church that would enable people to grow. Atmosphere that would provide a place for people of different stages in their Christian walk, in their Christian experience, to be welcome, to be accepted, and to be allowed to grow. If anyone receives a child, in my name, he said. Not because they are perfect, but if you receive people the way they are, in my name. What did he say next? You received me. And then he gives an illustration. He tells the story of a shepherd who would leave 99 sheep and would go in a different terrain, difficult terrain, going through the valleys or up the hills, in a very difficult spots, looking for that one sheep. Why would he connect this parable with, with a story about the children? What is the similarity between children and the sheep? They're vulnerable. Wouldn't you agree? They're both vulnerable. Why is he giving this illustration? This one lost sheep represents not just our world, our planet that that uh, was sunk in sin and Jesus went to look for this planet. But that parable represents each child of God, each single person. It shows that that little child, that lost sheep, has such a great value in the eyes of the shepherd that he is willing to do everything it takes. And we know that he left heaven to give his life for us. To bring that little sheep back. And he wants his disciples to understand. Here is my point, he says. Make sure you remember that that sheep is very, very vulnerable. That little child is very, very vulnerable. Isn't he a good shepherd? Isn't Jesus a great savior who really, really cares? This is the atmosphere of grace and love that he wants to make sure that his disciples get and understand and make sure that they provide that atmosphere in, in his church family, in his church. That sheep, that child is too precious, too costly to be mistreated. Jesus moves on to the next segment in this chapter. And he sets the culture for his church. Some people call that section in the, in the New Testament or in the Gospel of Matthew a church manual. But I want to call it different. I want to call it grace manual. Because anything else besides what Jesus prescribed us to do, my brothers and sisters, is leading to pain, is leading to unnecessary sufferings and problems. And so basically I could have entitled this sermon How to Stay Out of Trouble in Church. How to Stay Out of Trouble in Church. And this is what Jesus is talking about. He basically wants to guard his church from unnecessary trouble. He wants to set this atmosphere of grace. Let's read the next passage. 
in Matthew chapter, and this is the picture by Mitchell Tolley, and you can see how much love the shepherd has for that sheep, and the sheep is so vulnerable, and so gentle, and so trusting in the love of the shepherd. That sheep represents each person that Jesus died for. Atmosphere of grace. Let's go to the next slide and see the next scripture that Jesus addresses um, the relationship between the members of the church. He is leading his disciples by example. He is teaching them the principles that would keep every church, including ours, from many, many unnecessary problems. 18 verse 15. It says, moreover, if your brother sins against you, and by the way, many manuscripts don't have the phrase against you. So it can be both. It says, if your brother sins against you in New King James here, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. You know, when we are reading text from the scripture, we might not pick up the voice of Jesus. And you can take this scripture in two different ways. You can take it like this. If anyone sins, go and talk to him. Or go and tell him everything that he needs to hear. It depends how Jesus said those words. And when I think about that lost sheep, when I think about the little child that Jesus is presenting to his disciples, when I think about the whole chapter that deals with forgiveness, love, and care, I think Jesus said those words in a different tone of voice. I think, I think he would say something like this. If anyone sins, would you please, with gentle love and care, with love and tender care to that person, prayerfully, go and plead and talk with that person to provide healing. He says, if he will listen to you, you're saved, your brother. And the word saved in Greek is the same as healed. Like a doctor Working gently with the patient, you would bring healing. Unfortunately, unfortunately, our human nature doesn't lead us to that direction. Unfortunately, we go in a different route. And this is why Jesus was talking to his church, begging them for the atmosphere of grace. What do we usually do in our human nature? We need to talk to someone about it. We need to talk to someone about it. Let's go to the next slide. Oh my, OMG, did you hear? Leviticus 19.16. Let's go to Leviticus 19.16. Again, God is asking and pleading with his people in the book of Leviticus. Chapter 19 and verse 16. And I'd like you to open your Bible and see what your translation says there. In my translation it says, in Leviticus 19.16. I'm sorry, I got into Deuteronomy for some reason. Leviticus 19 and verse 16. It says, you shall... You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Some translations say, for example, New American Standard, it says in the second part of the verse, it says, do not act against the life of your neighbor. So sharing information or talking to someone and spreading rumors it says in the second line do not stand up against the life of that person 
Listen to what it says in God's word translation. It's very simple. Never gossip. Never endanger your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. You know, there is only one portion in Scripture that God did not trust man to write. He wrote it by himself, by his own finger. Do you know which portion of the Bible it is? Ten Commandments. God wrote Ten Commandments on the stone with his own finger. The rest of the Bible is God's commentary to the Ten Commandments. So, if the rest of the Bible, including this verse in Leviticus 19.16, is the commentary to the Ten Commandments, I, am, I have a question for you. Which of the Ten Commandments this text comments about? Pardon? Thou shall not kill. That's right. Yeah. I hope you picked it up from the, from the text. Because the text says, do not spread information or do not gossip, it says. And the next line says what? You're standing up against the life of the person. And other translations say, just barely, do not endanger the life of the other person. Because you're taking away the quality of life of the other person. The reputation, the dignity that God has given that person. And that's why it is connected with the commandment, thou shall not kill. And in New Testament, uh, the explanation is the same. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, it says that the tongue, the tongue is compared to the sword. And what does the sword do? Takes away life. So the words that are not directed in the right direction or not that not representing the person right, they're taking away life. They're killing. According to the Bible, they are killing. Killing the quality of life, killing dignity, killing the character of other person. It's interesting that the sword can reach only the, this far. But how about the words? The person may speak in Spokane, but kills where? In Seattle. A person may speak in Spokane, but kill in Missoula. The words go much further than the sword. But the actions are the same, according to the scripture. This is why Jesus is talking to his disciples about it. It is so important. It has to do with the life, life of the person. Life and death of the person. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 in our next slide. Matthew 5 and verses 21 and 22. Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount again is referring to this topic. He says, if you have heard it, that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Again, we see the commandment, thou shall not kill. But I say to you that whoever is what? Angry with a brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of a hellfire. How many of you did say to somebody, Raka, <laughs> you know? I don't remember saying to anybody those words. So I was, I was interested to know, what does it mean? I went to the original, and in Hebrew, for example, every word is built from the verb. Verbs are the foundation of the Hebrew language. So every word is built from the root of the verb. And the word Raka comes from... Hebrew, rakil, rakil, rakil. So I went to the dictionary to see what does that word mean. It means to scatter around, to carry around, to spread around. Wow. What does it remind you? 
spreading rumors, spreading information. But you may be saying, but what if the information is true? What if it's, if it's a true information? Am I still a tailbearer? Am I still a sinner? Am I still in trouble? If it's a good, I mean, if it's a, if it's a truth, I know for sure it's a truth. Here's the answer. If the information that you are spreading does not take away the quality of life of other person, you're okay. But if it diminishes or robs or takes away from the quality of life of the other person, this is the spreading around that Bible is talking about. Because, for example, there is a good information I can share with you. I just, I just shared information about my family, that in my family in Portland, they're going to have a baby girl. Does it take away the quality of their life? No. Or if somebody, somebody got a new job in Seattle, and you say, have you heard he got a new job in Seattle? But it depends what kind of coloring you will give to that story. Because sometimes we people, in our human nature... We tend either to exaggerate or add some information that does not belong there. Or just add our commentary and that's where, that's where we can be a tale bearer according to the scripture. This is why Jesus was so protective of his sheep, of his little children. He said, if anyone receives this little child in my name, you received me. But if you heard them, you heard me. I don't know, maybe I'm just preaching to myself this morning. But I, I think that Jesus is talking about the standard of grace. And I think that, um, unfortunately, in our culture, especially when elections are coming up, it seems to be okay. It seems to be okay to talk any negative information about anyone. It seems to be okay. But according to the scripture, it's not okay. Especially in the family of God. He said, Jesus said, if you care about this brother and sister as my little child, as my sheep, you will go to him with prayer and will, will be pleading with him, praying with him. This is how you will show grace. This is how you will show love to that person. So this is the commandment that has to do with any information that will hurt people in some way. Rob reputation, opportunities, hurt relationship. It is forbidden by the law of God. Forbidden by the law of God. So the soldier that wrote, the lieutenant today was sober. It was truthful information, right? But what was the intent of the information? It was such an outstanding event. It was such an amazing day. It was such an un in extraordinary thing that he had to report it on his paper. So what kind of information that projected to the rest of the community? In Matthew 26, let's go to Matthew 26, uh, verses 60 and 61. Matthew 26. And this is one more example that people presented uh, almost like a true information. Now let's, let's read those verses. Verses 60th and 61st. First, it says uh, that they were looking for accusations against Jesus. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward. And they said, This fellow, pointing to Jesus, said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Question, did Jesus say that? I went to the book of John where Jesus said those words. And I checked what did Jesus say. He said, I am able to destroy this temple. He said, this temple. And rebuild it in three days. And John adds commentary to the words of Jesus. He was speaking about the temple of his body. Now, Jesus didn't say specifically that I'm talking about my body. So they took the information that Jesus said, added their own meaning to the information, and what do they present as accusation? 
that he said he will destroy which temple? God's temple. Idea seems to be the same, but they are called again false witnesses. This is why when we try to um, repeat somebody's words and, and say to somebody else, oh, he said or she said, that's very, very unsafe ground. We will be tending to misrepresent that information. Again, this is something that would be very, very, very um, dangerous area to venture because we may be robbing some other person the quality of life that belongs to her or him. One pastor arrived to his new district and uh, he was getting acquainted with his church members and one of the church members came up to him and he said, Pastor, I have only one talent. The pastor said, okay, what is your talent? I have a talent of criticism. Oh, okay. Um, pastor didn't know how to react at first, but then a thought came to his mind and he said, you know what? I remember the story that Jesus tells us about the guy that had one talent. And you know what he did with that talent? He went and he hid it. He buried it. He said, I would suggest you would do the same. <laughs> there is a healthy criticism. The criticism that is directed to the right person. In the spirit of love and grace of Jesus. Jesus knew the human tendency to misrepresent, especially if there is a conflict if your brother sins against you, then there is such a great possibility to misrepresent things. Let's go to the next slide. Morris Mendel says that gossip is the most deadly microbe. It has neither legs nor wings. It is composed entirely of what? Tails. <laughs> and most of them have what? Stings. A culture of grace. This is what Jesus is talking about. He wants his church to be very, very careful. One of the Jewish rabbis says that three, thin, uh, sorry, three sins that rob person of present life and lead to the loss of the world to come are these. Three sins. Idol worship, incest, and murder. And he continues, but the slander is worse than these three. Since that sin kills three people at once. The slanderer, the one who is an object of slandering, and the one who opens the ears to listen. One sin kills three people at once. In Psalm 15, those are three people that the sin kills at once. Um, Psalm 15 Let's go to the book of Psalms, Psalm 15, verses 1 through 3. Let's go to the book of Psalms. The question is asked here about the very presence of God. The book of Psalms, Psalm 15, verses 1 through the third. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. The last portion of the scripture we just read is talking about the person who listens. So there are commandments for those who talk and there is a commandment for the one who listens. It says if we want to abide in the presence of God, we would not take, we would not receive, we would not listen. And that's a very difficult part. Especially for me as a pastor. How, how do I do it? If a person calls me, and he says, have you heard? I have a story to tell you. What do I do? What do you do in those situations? When you are 
you're sure, you, you are certain that the person is violating the commandment of God by diminishing the quality of life of other person, by spreading information that is ruining the reputation of the person. What do you do? It's rude to quit listening, you know. It's rude to hang up. So what would you do? I know the pastor that he taught us in the seminary. He said, when somebody comes to me, in that time when he was pastoring, there were no cell phones yet. So people would come to him and they would start unloading tons and tons of information. He said, I would go to my um, um, front door and start putting my shoes on. And uh, the people are asking me, what are you doing, pastor? I'm, I'm talking to you. What are you doing? He says, I'm putting my shoes on. We're going to go to that person together. And you will continue your story. That was his method. Maybe as a suggestion, you can say, excuse me, but why do I need to know this? Excuse me, but why do I need to know this? Because the listener, according to the scripture that we just read, as guilty by receiving that information because you help to spread whatever information is, is being spread about the person. And I, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about any specific situation that exists right now. I just want us to remember the teaching of Jesus about this important topic that deals with the culture of grace. And this is how we build the culture of grace. I'm so grateful for our church family because we do have culture of grace. We do have culture of grace that would enable everyone who comes here to be accepted and to be able to grow in grace. When you have to say to somebody, I'm sorry, I cannot listen to this. I'm sorry, I, I don't know why I need this information. You will not be popular. But this is the price of discipleship that Jesus is talking about. This is the price of accepting the culture of grace, the standard of grace in your life. Otherwise, grace becomes disgrace. We need a converted heart to provide that culture of grace. Jesus teaches ethics to his disciples. He is teaching ethics of his kingdom. We are in the school of, of Christ. So what do we need to do? Jesus tells his disciples, go talk to him. Pray first. Make sure you have the love of Jesus in your heart. If he doesn't listen, what did he say? Take two or three other people. Pray together. Go plead with a person. Reach out in the grace of Christ. And if he doesn't listen, what to do next, he says. Share with the church family. They need to reach out to that person. This is the culture of grace. Otherwise, it leaves scars and hurts relationship for a long time. One of the, my favorite preachers, evangelists, Dwight Nelson, in 1998, he was doing a satellite evangelism. It was called Net 98. From um, Andrews University, um, Pioneer Memorial Church, and it was broadcasted over all the globe. And uh, as he was presenting one of his sermons, he wanted to share an illustration. It was a special illustration, which was an object lesson, rather. And he practiced that illustration. The point he wanted to establish that if one commandment is broken, all the law is broken. So what he wanted to do, he wanted to bring on stage a... Um, Glass, uh, goblet, did I say it right? Yeah, and, uh, and he wanted to shatter it with a hammer to, to prove that you can't break just one piece of the goblet. Everything is broken if you break one. So he practiced, and uh, the person who was helping him, he said, you know, it's kind of dangerous a little bit because the pieces will fly everywhere. And so he said, but you know what? We can do something about it. If we use a tape and we tape one side of the goblet that is turned to the people, then it should be fine. And then Pastor Dwight Nelson did his experiment and then he wrote in one of his books, he said, you know what, the law of physics 
you know, let me down that night. Because for some reason, <laughs> we put the tape, but for some reason, those pieces did fly everywhere, including people in the first rows in the audience. Well, nobody was hurt. But as he continued to preach, some of his helpers went around picking glass from the, from the audience. And he was kind of distracted a little bit in his sermon because people were taking care of the glass that was in the audience. I thought, wow, that's an interesting illustration that would fit my sermon just perfectly. When we are not careful about the atmosphere of grace, we never know where those pieces are going to fly. And we never know how bad they're going to hurt. And people tried to pick them up, but is it possible to pick up all the pieces? No, it's not possible. This is why Jesus is so um, focused on the atmosphere of grace. In fact, in the upper room, when he's talking to his disciples, he said, there is one thing that people need to see in you, that they will know that you are my disciples. What was his concern? If you will do what? Love one another. Did he forget about other doctrines? Did he forget about other important teachings of the church? No, he didn't forget about anything. All those things are important. They have their place. But the culture of grace, the love that Jesus taught us, would be the final sign of his church. If we do love one another. And how do we love one another? If we care for the reputation of another person. If we are careful to obey the commandments of God. I looked up the definition for the word culture. It says that culture can be defined as predominating attitudes and behavior that characterize the functioning of a group or organization. Predominating attitudes. Wow, that's beautiful. Attitude of grace. Do we have room to grow? I do have room to grow. I don't know about you, but I do need to grow in that area. A set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterizes the institution or organization. Brothers and sisters, my church family, do we want to be known in the in Spokane area as a church that has a culture of grace, that has a standard of grace? Wouldn't that be wonderful? I think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He, has just, he is just hours from the cross. What is he praying about? What is his burden for his church? What is his burden for us as a church family? Father, I pray that they may be what? One. That they would not be separated and turn apart by the enemy. They would be one. Our oneness is our need of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that? Do we need Jesus to learn from him, to follow him, to belong to him, and to be his representatives here in terms of grace and love? We share with others only what we received ourselves. If we have experienced the forgiveness and love and grace of God, we'll be able to give it to others. Have you experienced the goodness of God? Have you experienced his grace, his love, his forgiveness? And this is what Jesus keeps talking about because Pharisees are still not getting it. They're asking, so how many times should we forgive? And what did Jesus say? Or forgive them 490 times. Or what did he say? No, every time. There. Provide the atmosphere of grace and forgiveness every time for the people to grow. For the people to grow because they are God's children. Jesus had only one burden when he was going to the cross. He 
He had a burden for his church, for his family, to have culture of love and grace. The rest will take care of itself. Don't you love Jesus for that? Don't you love Jesus that he asks us to provide his love and grace to others and he is so loving and gracious we can't even imagine. He is so patient. He is so loving. Now friends, we often misunderstand what the church is or what the church is supposed to be. We think sometimes that the church is gathering of the saints. The word saint is used in the Bible very, very freely and generously. In fact, God speaks about his church in the terms what it is going to be by his grace. His church is a gathering of people that are united in our great need of Christ. Life's broken. Dealing with challenges. Struggling with things here and there. But we are united with one thing. We come here because we need Jesus in our lives. And if I come to the hospital with my need, what has more importance to me, my need or the need of the other person on the fifth floor that has a different need? I want to make sure that I receive help that I need. We can all be united because we come here in our need of Christ. I'm so grateful for Jesus to provide his atmosphere and standard of grace so we can grow, so we can learn. And there is healing if we are struggling in this area. And I don't know, maybe you're not struggling in this area with sharing information that may be uh, not quite good for other person. There is healing. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah was in the vision. And he said, Lord, my tongue, my tongue. There is healing. There is a place where we can go and receive forgiveness and healing from God to have atmosphere of grace. Let's go to our scripture that we will close with in the book of Isaiah, chapter 33. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 33, verses 14 through 17. Isaiah 33. All right. Verses 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with a devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? This is talking about the second coming of Jesus because everlasting fire is God's presence itself. It's talking about the coming of the Lord. He who walks righteously, who speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed, shuts his eyes from seeing evil. He will dwell on high his place of defense will be a fortress of rocks. Bread will be given to him. His water will be sure. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will see the land that is very far off. I'm so grateful for the promise. Do you know who this promise is given to? It's given to us. To the people like you and me that have one need, the need of Christ. And if we come to him, he will lead us, he will guide us, and he will bless us with his grace so we can give his grace to others. Amen.